I do. I want to talk to you about a, a concept that you um, find in the Bible quite often, and um, I very seldom heard anybody talk about it, but it's um, it's 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 actually usually part of Paul's greetings. Um, Paul sometimes describes himself as a bond servant. So in my um, inquisitiveness, I started looking at what does he mean? Bond servant? Bond servant of what? And then I um, throw into blue letter Bible, bond servant, and I realized but most of the um, apostles at one stage or the other introduces themselves as bond servants. So that had me intrigued. So I started looking into the word and, and understanding what does it mean? Um, but before we start Let's, um, let's quickly go to a word of prayer and then we'll go into Romans 6 and start looking around in the Bible and, and see what we can learn. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. That you are a marvelously powerful God, but that you are also gracious and loving and, and very patient with us. And we thank you for that because we certainly do need that. Lord, we are, we are sinners, but we are sinners that are saved through faith. We are not perfect, but we are your your children, and we we are so in awe of what you've done for us. Even in our imperfection, you were willing to die for us, rather than letting us go to the death that we so so deserve. Lord, Lord we pray that um, you'd open our hearts and our minds, and that everybody here would understand what your word says and, and what they should take away from it and that they should apply to their own lives Lord we thank you that you are so good to us just living in this marvelous country is such a blessing Lord and that we are able to to serve you freely and um, have no fear of persecution is, is, is marvelous Lord we think of the churches that are not that free and that have to gather in secret and that worship you in secret because um, at any moment somebody can bust open the door and um, they could go to jail or worse Lord we pray for every person that are living in the country that are persecuted that are a believer of you we pray that you strengthen them and that you would guide them and, and give them providence Lord we thank you for the rate at which the church is growing in, in, in countries that have got persecution. Simultaneously, we thank you that we don't have that, Lord. We pray that the missionaries that we support would protect them and save them and give them marvelous boldness to proclaim your gospel, even under utmost circumstances of, of danger and uh, imminent threat of, to their lives, Lord. We think of this fellowship, we also think of other churches in this area, and we ask that you, you guide them, we ask that you bless the pastors and that you would give them clarity and that they would stick to your word, Lord, and that they would teach good doctrine and that the church would grow. We know that in, in New Zealand there's a hunger for the word, there's a hunger for truth, Lord. We see it among us, among us. we see, see it about us. We ask that you would use us and that we would understand the calling that you have for every one of us. That we would go out and, and be faithful witnesses and, and that our testimonies would stay unmarred and that we would be able to demonstrate your great love and and, and the, the message of the gospel would, would come out of us. We pray this in the marvelous name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Amen. Yeah. Right, I'm going to read from Romans 6.16 and just to lead us into this bondservant theme that I've um, that I'm busy discovering and looking into. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, ye servants ye are to whom you uh, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death 
or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of our flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the Bible, it teaches us that we are either serving God or are we serving the enemy, his, or his enemy, the devil, the devil? We are slaves to him, or we are slaves to God, willing or unwilling. We are slaves of something. Ephesians two, read, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So, before we were converted to Christians, we were serving this spirit, this power of, of, of the air, we know is, um, is Satan, okay? The prince of the power of the air. So what is that thing in your life that's keeping you enslaved? It may be different things for different people. It may be something you have never considered. What takes up the most time in your life? It may even just be that your priorities are slightly twisted because you have never been taught the priorities of God's institutions and where what belongs. Some of us are acutely aware of the things that enslaved us, a habit that we cannot shake, something that we got ourselves into in our youth and now cannot get rid of, some toxic rela relationship. Perhaps you are unequally yoked in a marriage that with an unsaved person. Some people are slaves to religion. What on earth could you be meaning by that, brother? A slave to religion? Well, let me put it to you this way. Religion kills. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you might be sitting here today thinking that you can earn your way into heaven attend church you might even pray you might even read the Bible but you're not saved you haven't made a commitment to Christ and accepted him as your personal saviour you relying on a deeds based religion rather than having a personal relationship with Christ I am persuaded that the Lord's Word, this one, is the manual for human living. And the Gospel is the key to true happiness. Without us accepting the key, this manual remains locked in a mystery. You might read it and actually have got no idea what's going on. 
Without Christ, life is meaningless. We are merely existing. We might even be tools of the enemy. We might even willingly be partaking in the, in the wills of the enemy. God gave us the keys in the form of a gift. Look again at that last verse in Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Think about it. If it's a gift, how can you earn it? Say... You're speeding along State Highway 1 and the trooper pulls you over and uh, as he knocks on the window, you open it and you stick a $100 bill out there. <laughs> What's that called? Bribe. It's a bribe. Now, in a court, you can argue, no, it was a gift. However, we all know that it was a bribe indeed. Similarly, if you're trying to earn your salvation, you're offering the judge of the universe a bribe. Do you think you're going to come right? He says, you have to accept my son's death. And you're saying, well, I'll rather go to church and I'll go to Bible study and I'll, I'll read my Bible and I'll pray three hours a day and I'll, and I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll tithe and I'll do this and I'll and, and, and I do, 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 but I don't believe. What am I doing? I'm bribing the judge of the universe. How do you think that's going to go down? In that court, one day, that big court, it's going to be what it is. It's going to be a bribe. It's not going to be. He's giving you a gift. You cannot earn it. By merely trying to earn it, you are in dangerous territory. However, when you accept that gift, there's a life-changing thing that happens to you. And you will change. And things will be different in your life. But you can't earn it. You cannot. By accepting that Jesus died for your sins, you receive this gift. He pays that speeding fine that you incurred. The Lord pays that speeding fine on your behalf. And not only that, He pays for every hour, everything else that you did wrong. The things that you were caught of, the things you didn't get catched doing, the things that you did even in your mind, just that thought, that little, you even, you, you shelved it quick enough and it was there. The Lord paid for that as well. Every sin, He paid for. Now Paul introduces himself on occasion as a bond servant of Christ. What does he mean? The Lord paid for our sins and we're free. We're free. How's, 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 what's the story with this bond servant thing, you know? Let's look at the Old Testament and um, let's see if we can find some hints as to what a bond servant would have been and what Paul understands. Now remember, Paul is a learned Jewish man. He's a legal mind of note. He, he's, he's quite a... He introduces himself as, the, as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he's had a, quite a, a detailed upbringing and, and teaching. Um, or he's a learned man out of the Jewish law. Let's look at a part of the Jewish law that might put some light onto what he would have meant by Bonson. Turn to Exodus 21 with me. Exodus 21. For those that don't understand what I'm doing, I'm, I'll, I'll always print the scripture in here because um, it's too hard to find it in, in the Bible and my eyes are not that great anymore. So if I have to have the glasses on, it gets a little bit busy up here. 
So Exodus 21 verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be his, her masters, and he shall not go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an owl. You know why it's called an owl, eh? Owl! <laughs> And he shall serve him forever. So this man came into debt, couldn't pay his debt, was sold into slavery. And this is part of the Hebrew law. This guy that bought him as the service of this man for six years. However, in this period, he has got a wife and children out of the other slaves that were serving this specific master. And when he's supposed to go free, he realizes, but his life with this master is much better than his life out by himself. And he declares that he'd rather serve this master. So the master takes him and sticks an owl through his ear. Okay. If he loves his master due to the goodness and the fairness of his master, he remains a freed slave and will serve his master forever. A bond servant. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He loves his master and he will serve his master forever. You see, Paul's master is my master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He freed me from sin. That was not, I can't even repeat yet. Okay. He freed my wife. He freed my daughter. He freed my son. The lives that we used to live, we don't live anymore. I'm no longer dependent on anything. Mostly things that was once attracted to me now disgust me. Or I even find it boring, maybe shallow. Yet I was so afraid that if I submit my life to Jesus, that I will stop having fun. It's amazing. <coughs> the truth is, I only started living properly after I met Jesus. Amen. As soon as the Spirit of the Lord convinced me by studying the Lord's Word, I realized that his will was, my, was what I wanted for my life. And I started doing it. I started following God's will for my life. This. I started reading this. It's first as slow as this. And sort of clumsily you struggle and you can't understand half of it. And there's a lot of things you don't understand. But there's here and there start, you have these little epiphanies. And you start realizing that the Lord's speaking to you. And as you study it more and more, it becomes more and more, um, you know, it makes more sense to you, you know. So I started teaching my wife and my children, first Wednesday nights and sometimes Sundays and so on, very clumsily. My son sat there looking at me very skeptically initially. <laughs> You know, there's nobody as so skeptical as your own family when you've made a huge change in your life. They're all looking at you thinking, oh, what's this all about? Yeah. I think he quite liked the way we lived. We used to race motorcycles and, you know, it was liquor and all sorts. And he, I think he, he it appealed to him, you know. He liked this hurrah, rah, rah, life that we were leading. It was, you know, it was manly and, you know. But in any case, um, 
But the Lord is faithful, and He worked in both my children's heart. Mm. And despite my own sinful past, my children are now both regenerate. And He's my wife as well. Slowly, the Lord restored my family to a God-honoring one. Mm. And my house to a house of the Lord. Actually, literally so. Um, for years, our local fellowship in, in the shore gathered in our house. <laughs> so it literally became a house of worship, which was amazing. I mean, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that. Years before, all sorts of other things going on, but, you know, <laughs> not that. <clears throat> the Lord blessed us by restoring our marriage. I still have to watch my step. <laughs> but... A husband is first among equals. If I dare go where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and if I dare say it, as I submitted to the Lord, and my wife and children submitted to the Lord, and to me, and we submitted to each other, we see how God honors His Word. And His Word show us a certain order of things. If we are obedient to Him, the true meaning of life starts to unfold. And we began being obedient and started to look for His will in our lives. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. We are made to serve God freely. We are born free. So we could do what we wanted. But what we wanted wasn't necessarily good for us. There's a difference between what we want and what we need. We all want all the glitzy, nice stuff and you know, all the shiny stuff. Yeah? What we need is salvation. Redemption. But being a good father, when we submit to his plan, he blesses us. And the joy that fills our life is inexpressible. Now, I've been saved for about eight years now. And I look back, and now I'm sorry that it took me so long. Why didn't I submit to God earlier? You know? I wasted so much time. I could have spent in his service. I could have spent... Serving Him, yet I chose to serve, well, who knows what I served, it wasn't God. <coughs> who knows what the Lord said is true? Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, the door I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He stood there knocking. I know, I knew he was knocking. I knew it. Not now, not now, Lord. I'm busy. Not now. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next year. And he kept knocking. Who knows that God is a patient God? My family and friends will tell you I can try anybody's patience. <laughs> Joel Austin writes a book, Your Best Life Now. Well, he was almost right once. <laughs> Being born again is the best way to live your life on earth. And then having your best life with Jesus after this life is the best life. Man, if this life now is your best life, do you know what it implies? If this is your best life, if, 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 if you follow what Joel Austin is saying, and you're living your best life now, what does it imply? Where are you going after this? Yeah. Hey? Yeah. Do you understand some, some of the drill that some people spin, and it sounds so nice because we're so well-spoken and eloquent, you know? So shiny, such beautiful smiles. White teeth, beautiful gestures, you know. 
people buy into it. There's about 30,000 people buying into his nonsense. Your best life now? <coughs> Makes a mockery of what Christ is promising us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going to come and he's going to renew everything. Mm -hmm. He's going to show us how life is really lived. Right. If, that's your, if this, this fallen world at the moment is the best life you can have, doesn't say much about what we expect after this, isn't it? The Lord's Word says it best. Isaiah 55. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, you have to relinquish control of your life so that God can take control of it. In any case, having control over your lives is indeed an illusion. If you think you've got control over your life, being an unsaved person, you are unbelievably deceived. God is in control, believe me. But if you're not saved, you are under somebody else's control. However, if you relinquish control to God, He is better equipped to have control over us than anybody else. God is omniscient. He knows it all. He is omnipotent. He has all the power. He is also an all-loving God towards all those who love Him. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Who is this? He is my Father. Unto him be the glory in the church. How long? Throughout the ages. You understand when the Bible talks about the ages, the ages is a time, time is only applicable in the world now when He comes again and He resets the clocks. There's no time when we go into eternity with Him. Time becomes immaterial. So throughout the ages, and then He says an interesting thing, world without end. It seems like such a, just a blind little attachment there. What is the world without end? It's the world that the Lord has remade. If you go and look in Revelation, He's going to recreate everything again. After this, if you read it, if you believe it, I do. He says it. If He says it, I believe it. Amen. That's right. Now I want to read to you Romans 6 again. In conclusion, Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. It's, it's quite clear down the middle. You either obey God or not. And these are two paths. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. I was gracious enough to share with you the gospel through a believer. You were in that moment a sinner and you were serving sin and you were on your way to be dead for eternity. But from the heart, in other words, the Lord knows the heart you believed. From the heart. Not just saying it with your mouth, but truly in the heart believed that doctrine, that gospel that saved you. The Lord delivered you, which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. So you crossed over from this part of the equation to that part of the equation. 
I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. We all have this problem. We've got this sinful nature that pulls us away from what God wants us to do. Even though we know what God wants us to do, we sort of always tend to go off at a tangent. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So from being a sinner and a servant of sin and being a servant of the dark one, you become now a servant of righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, so when you believed something happened, you were freed. These bonds, these, these chains were cast off. And you became for the first time actually able to not sin. Until that moment where you believe, you, you're incapable of not, you know, even <laughs> these, these passages that, that allude to the fact that even our prayers in our unsaved state is an abomination to God. Mm. You understand that when you're not saved and you pray to God, you are, <laughs> it's, it's abominable. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. <clears throat> For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray.